All right. So hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for taking time. I'm just going to get right into our, our presentation uh, during, the, during the, the hashtag scholar strike, uh, which is, uh, is going to affect uh, not just social justice, but also artificial intelligence uh, at the at sort of core levels. And so the title of this presentation is, uh, is That Ain't Right. Uh, this is how about AI, how AI mistakes can affect black lives, but, but really all of our lives. And so, um, so one thing I might direct your attention to is the, is, uh, is black and computing.org. And so this is a letter that I helped, uh, I helped write over the, over the summer that was really coming after the, the, um, the, the George, uh, with the incident with George Floyd, his, his, uh, his, uh, his death, um, his unfortunate death, the tragedy that that re represents, um, and uh, and 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 talk history uh, throughout uh, throughout our, our our nation throughout our nation's history, but also um, things that we can do not just to improve everybody's lives, but what we can do in computing uh, to do to do more because because um, not only does computing have a big effect on on everybody's life, but there's also things that we can do inside of computing to bring to improve the systemic uh, systemic to address the systemic problems and also have systemic better systemic outcomes. And we talk about that with respect to how individuals can do better, how organizations can do better and how communities can do better. Um, but these things are still pretty active in terms of how do you how do you think about, you know, what happened with Jacob Blake, what happened with Breonna Taylor, um, what happened to Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, George Floyd? How does that affect what we do in computing? How does that affect what we think about on campus? Um, and so I think it gets a lot more grounded when we think about the case of Robert Williams. And then there's another case that has come up uh, recently too, a second case of, uh, of, of using artificial, effectively facial recognition for, uh, for, for miscarriages of justice when it comes to false arrest of, of, uh, of black Americans, people, uh, black people in America. Um, and so in this case, this, the case that happened here, uh, this, was, this was an incident that took place in, uh, in January 9th this, of this past year, which I tell everybody is my 46th birthday, a, a terrible birthday present to have happen. But, um, but um, on January 9th, what happened was, was that Robert Williams, Who's, uh, and who him and his, uh, his, uh, his, his, uh, his family, his wife and his two kids, uh, they live in Farmington Hills, which is not far away from, from, uh, from Ann Arbor. And he was falsely arrested purely off of a, off of a, a false facial recognition uh, 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 output. Um, and so uh, it's best, I, I could try to tell a story, but it's best when you hear it, hear it from their perspective. I hope this audio is reasonable. I'm doing my best. They came to the door. Um, I answered it and I kind of stuck their foot in the door and said, send Robert out. And I said, he's not here. They said, we just saw him come out of that van. And I said, that was my mom. He's not here. I pull in the driveway here, hop out. By the time I close the door, the car is in the driveway blocking me in. As soon as we shut the door, they were right on him. And they were already starting to cuff him by the time we get out there. I was, I was completely shocked and stunned we arrested in front, of, in front of my wife, in front of my neighbors. I can't really put it into words. It was, it was one of the most shocking things I ever had happen to me. And we get to the interview room, and the detective turns over a picture of a guy, and he's like, so that's not you? I look, I said, no, that's not you. He turns another paper over, he said, I guess that's not you either. I pick that paper up and hold it next to my face. This is not me. Like, I hope y'all don't think all black people look alike. And then he says, the computer says it's you. Hey, Julia. Yes. Julia, you know why daddy's got arrested? Because I looked up, up on the computer. Oh, man, that's heartbreaking to hear that. Um, but um, but but it's right. What 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 had happened was was that uh, purely off of a false recognition re recognition hit. So that so what you're seeing in the upper uh, upper corner there is uh, is the actual footage of a of a robbery that had had to take place. Uh, and and you know grainy video, low resolution video, and fr and from a facial recognition hit on that, they went and arrested a uh, had a false positive, uh, and then arrested the wrong person. Um, which, which I believe they've admit, admitted to. 
Uh, but that doesn't mean that he didn't still spend 30 hours in jail, uh, that he wasn't, uh, and, and, you know, and, and treated like, you know, like he was, uh, like he was guilty. Um, it, it didn't mean that he didn't, uh, that, it didn't mean that, that he wasn't, uh, you know, humiliated in front of his neighbors, uh, his family, his daughters, uh, people that, you know, that he, he would like to be known as a respectable citizen, or at least if that would happen to me, that's what, how I'd feel about it. Um, and, you know, and I think it's led to some larger questions about how we, how we use facial recognition uh, by, in law enforcement, but it's not just law enforcement. It could be, uh, it could be admissions for higher education. It could be hiring. It could be uh, finances. It could be, uh, you know, the, the financial services. There's many different areas where, uh, where the technologies we're creating on campus could have a big impact on, on what, what opportunities you get or do not get. Um, and so when we look at the, at the arrest sheet, uh, you know, you can see again that what we have here is, you know, from uh, from a, qu a query image that is blurry and low resolution, uh, we get we you that basically hits on on this person and and really what's behind this is a lot of neural network technology that I I think we have overestimated the capabilities of, um, and we can, just to get a sense of this, uh, this was uh, this was um, uh, a a picture sort of taken so this there was a uh, a recent uh, piece of work from uh, uh, that was published that talked about how you could do uh, how you could take low resolution blurry images and and uh, and um, and make them higher resolution using uh, using your common sort of machine learning technologies um, and so I'm just this showed right here and so what they did what somebody did was they took a picture of President o, uh, President Obama. Um, who is, you know, who is, uh, you know, half black, half white, I think African parent uh, uh, um, and, uh, and a white, Amer white American mother, uh, you know, they took a picture of him and, uh, and ran it through the network and they got the result on the side, which does not look anything like Obama, President Obama, from my perspective. Um, and I think it really got it wrong. That ain't right. Um, and these technologies are being used all over the place. And so this is just a piece from, from Vice. This was, uh, this was about six years ago that they were talking about the use of surveillance, tech, uh, surveillance technology. And I think it had some, uh, some foreshadowing effects. Beyond that, there are things like facial recognition software that's now being combined with surveillance cameras. Probably the most interesting thing I've heard about linking of X-ray and infrared monitoring with surveillance cameras so that these cameras can actually do something known as a virtual stop and frisk. It looks like we're going down the road of more and more surveillance in all of these cities. Um, yeah, so that, that was, you know, I mean, that was, that was six years ago that we're talking about uh, the, this technology. And so what I'd like to say, though, is that, that it's not just about the use of technology in, um, in law enforcement, but there's also a systemic problem that we could see on campus and that, uh, that I'd like to, to bring your attention to. Um, in this regard, I would like to, I would say that the field of artificial intelligence, which you will become a part of as the future leaders of our field, which I, I hope, I'm, hope I'm training a lot of future leaders and innovators in our field, uh, we have systemic problems in that when we were coming up with the original AI technology, there were very few and marginalized black AI researchers. Um, I know that because what, cause over my uh, 20 year, 20 year plus history in, uh, in artificial intelligence robotics, usually I'm the only black person in the room. Uh, but, uh, but there are a few others, but, um, but you know, but, and, and even if you're, even if we just think about it outside of, outside of race, there's always an issue of sort of uh, mono of everybody thinking the same way. And you know, not having a diversity of ideas. Um, even the neural networks that we love now uh, were on the margins. Of, uh, were very much pushed out of machine learning and artificial intelligence just 15 years ago. And uh, unfortunately, had people that were studying those ideas that had those sort of diverse thoughts that went past the groupthink in order to to help us take to take things to the next level, introduce the next wave of AI. And so we've we have a, we've had a diversity problem in AI research for a while. Um, when we think about how that research trans thing here, I'm, I'm just going to summarize this really quickly is that we just haven't had a lot of people uh, in, in AI research that represents the diversity of thought, but also a diversity of backgrounds. Uh, the same thing happens for, for system development and that we haven't had necessarily, uh, everybody is so crunched to try to get that big job at Google or Facebook or, or Amazon that, um, that, you know, that we really haven't had 
we that that you know that having diversity of thought and people and backgrounds is also sort of crunched out of the system and then there's just uh you know this leads to systems that are overhyped and uh and and not really understood and so that leads to uneducated unwise unethical use when it's deployed such as by law enforcement um and so uh and so there's been a lot of work that has gone into studying what I would consider to be what, called the, what I call the front end problem, uh, which, is, uh, which is once these technologies develop, how are they used? How do you think about fairness in those systems? How do you think about, um, about, their, uh, about, um, about the, the, the ramifications of this? And how can you develop mechanisms to, to score, to, to metrics that could be used to, to evaluate uh, what are ethical or fair, fair types of systems. Um, but what I, what I know a lot about, I don't, I don't know that as much because I'm not a social scientist, but, um, but what I think about is the back end problem, because that's what we see on campus. Um, and so you could look at the, at the, uh, the, the, diver the climate diversity, equity, inclusion report that came out of CSE. So my good colleague, Wes, Wesley Weimer, uh, helped lead that along with the CSE diversity committee and, and people across uh, EECS. Um, and so you can see that our numbers don't really look <laughs> look that great when it comes to diversity, and that says a lot about what we're doing in terms of the um, in terms of what what we're seeing in the research labs as the as the technologies of the future are developed, and then also what we're seeing in the classroom in terms of the people that are going to make the change in this world. You as 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 people at the University of Michigan are going to make big change. Uh, you can just see it from our alumni the amount of the amount of influence uh, and impact. Uh, University of Michigan graduates have on the on the world. Um, and the thing is, is that it's really easy to make systems that don't perform well, uh, um, and that that maybe even give the illusion of of doing of of performing well, but not necessarily are very good. So, you know, so you can just make a you can make a surveillance systems pretty 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 quickly, or any sort of decision making system. Um, and I'm assuming that most people know what neural networks are, but in case you haven't, in case you haven't seen, uh, the basics of it looks something like this. What you're doing is given some input. In this case, let's say it's an image if you want to build a, a surveillance system. And what you want to produce on the output is some sort of uh, is some sort of label or some sort of classification about these are the things that I, so say for instance these are the things I see these are the people that I see here's things you might want to know about these people such as are they a threat or not a threat are they a good credit risk or a bad credit risk should we admit this person or should we not admit this person or maybe what kind of other features about them, and this process is really can be think thought of as a uh, uh, people are already asking me questions on the phone, if you can hear that. Um, uh, forgive that. Um, but, uh, but really, we can think of this as a, as a function that maps uh, from, as, a F, as a y equals f of x, uh, taking some input x and outputting y. And this really needs a lot of data. And so what we do is we, have, uh, we get massive training sets, ma massive, massive training sets, where in and of itself, uh, being able to, to provide this labeled training data is itself a, its own industry um, because it takes, it's such labor, it's such a labor intensive process. Um, and so we're seeing this spring, spring up all over the world. And once you, have, uh, once you have this labeled data, you can then use that to train your, your network using something like a back propagation algorithm, if you come from my generation, or, uh, or more recently, stochastic gradient descent algorithms. And so you update this training and you have, a, now you, once you have a trained model, you can then take an image and produce uh, recognitions to do, some, to do some sort of surveillance or, or predictive task on, on image data. But the problem with a lot of these recognitions is that that ain't right. It's just, uh, there they usually are many mistakes that are hard to figure out uh, when those mistakes occur, but also what, you know, you know is, this a, is this a valid result or not? Um, and some of these results, um, and, uh, and some of these are false positives. So they may be, they may say, or I recognize this, but that's, a, that's an incorrect recognition. So in these cases, we have cars that are being labeled as buses. Um, but even more, more dangerous, I think, are, are the false negatives, uh, the things that aren't labeled properly that, uh, that if, you, you know, if you don't think about it, uh, you know, actually are, are throughout your data. And so we have many, and these are just a few examples of the kind of errors that we would get. And so there's a number of things that you should think about when you're, when you're looking at these types of systems. Uh, how did these mistakes occur? Um, you know, what kind of explanation can you get for mistakes? Or how do you know when a mistake is, is or not, is not occurring? And so how do you, you know, how do you, how do you know? 
how can we fix these mistakes is usually what a lot of people are thinking about in terms of fixing neural networks. But I would argue that there are other types of AI systems going back to traditional search based AI systems or probabilistic inference that could be that that could not necessarily help you fix a mistake, but help you recover from them or maintain plausibility belief about what what you're seeing. And then you should also be thinking about what was the cost paid for the mistake. If I, you know, if I have a system that's that's 99% accurate, you know, um, and they have one failure out of every 100, then, you know, and Amazon's using that socks on time, you know, if my socks show up late, I'm okay with that. You know, one in 100, I'm fine. Um, but if I'm getting on a plane and that plane has a one in 100 chance of, of not, not, not arriving safely, I don't think I'm getting on that plane. Um, and so we have to think about what, what were the ramifications of this. And I'm already running late. Sorry about this. Uh, and so, uh, so we use this all these systems all the time for uh, for um, for uh, for robotics. So we have our, our robot. It's basically looking at a cluttered tabletop, and then uh, from that, it decides what it wants, to, what it's looking for. It picks it up, and then goes goes to deliver it. And so that's uh, that's something that we do we do all the time. Uh, and is is uh, is uh, is part of the research, but as I said, neural networks are optimistically 80, 80 to ninety eight percent, maybe ninety nine percent, depending on how much training you, you data you have and how much time you spend uh, you spend uh, doing the care and feeding of this uh, of this neural network model. And you can see that even in these cases, we still are going to have false positives that occur, and we're still going to have false negatives that occur, um, even in our in our tabletop scenario here in our laboratory environment. And so some of the work that we've been doing has been thinking about how we can, how we can uh, address these issues. Um, and so this is work that's came out of my lab. Chow Tong, who is one of the, one of the GSIs for the class, is the lead author on this paper called The Grip that appeared. Um, and that really is starting to think about how can we, this idea is how can we take neural networks and put them into a probabilistic framework? So even if, so we use them as a guess, as an initial thought, but we don't necessarily carry them out into, and we don't get the actual decision from them. We actually embed it into a, a probabilistic, a more explainable, more um, introspectable, more robust probabilistic uh, inference uh, framework. Um, and so, you know, and so this is, uh, this is a paper from, uh, that we recently got published. Uh, this, is, this is Jana Pavlosik, who's one of the students in my group who led, led this paper. But what we can do is we can break up objects or anything that we'd like to recognize into, into parts. And then we can use a Markov random field to say, well, if we get observations from a neural network that say, we can see these types of, uh, we can see these types of parts on the object, we can use belief propagation to send messages between those recognitions to improve the quality of the of the inference and at least get some sort of uh, some sort of explainable hypothesis to the result to the result that we're making or the decision that we're going to make and so in this case what we have is we have um, we have the neural network give us some guesses we use the markov random field and belief propagation along with some notion of trees that can be flexible in order to do this type of recognition. And so we're, so I'm not going to get into the details of this. And since I'm running behind, I'm not going to show the rest of this video, but really it's, it's starting to get towards, um, towards providing, you know, providing generative hypotheses on what we're seeing from, um, from our, uh, from, from our systems. And that can provide the robustness and explainability that can be used in a more responsible way. And so really, you know, I, I'd like to, so, so even though our AI system has failed systemically, there's a lot of things that can be done. There's a lot of things that you can do to help us, help us do better. And, and we, and, um, and, and so uh, I'm going to skip most of this stuff and I'm going to, I'm going to say that, that, you know, in the history of, of AI, great book by Nils Nilsson, that is the quest for artificial intelligence. There are no black people in there. Um, in fact, it's a very, it's a very sort of, um, North American European view on, on artificial intelligence. And so I think that we can have broader views on that. Um, I think when you look at our field, uh, you know, I think we can do better. This is the demographics that we have in terms of the population, the labor force, and then the tech sector. You can see that African Americans, Latinos are, uh, are really, are lit. I think are really, uh, are really not represented in, in this. Um, and this isn't to say that, that, uh, that, you know, to say, uh, people that are overrepresented are bad people <laughs> and, and that, you know, that you should be guilty about that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we should invest more in, uh, in helping others come up instead of bringing people down. It's not about bringing people down. 
Um, and so what we're seeing right here is what we call a disparate impact and that even though anybody could apply to the University of Michigan or apply to be a part of the tech sector, we're seeing the, that, you know, as an individual, you have opportunities available, but the system as a whole is producing disparate impacts in terms of we're seeing, uh, we're seeing big inequities in terms of, uh, in, in terms of the out, in terms of the outcomes. And so this leads, that disparate impact leads to, to big problems in terms of the seeing coming from uh, from technology um, and that is biases because everybody has biases but if you only have a small set of people represented in your development team then those biases become magnified because you're missing viewpoints and so there's things that you can do as a leader in our field as you as you come up um, and that is uh, and, and and I and I uh, I talk about these things in my um, Oops, let me get my pointer working. I, my, my keynote talk at RSS 2018, man, that went by too fast. Uh, my keynote talk at RSS 2018, uh, I talked about it. Basically, uh, I talked about what you can do. You can eliminate your double standards. Are you, this is mostly for my faculty colleagues, but for students, are you treating your fellow classmates well? Are you consistent in how you treat them of people that are uh, of the generations coming after you, the new students? Are you, are you good with, not only are you good with everybody, but are you consistent with how you're, how you're treating people? And also knowing that, also understanding that there are, that everybody is not gonna have the same advantages that you have, and you may not have the same advantage as somebody else, but are you, are you do you have that, that awareness? And then you look around, we look at our classroom, we look at our committees, our student groups, uh, when we start to build, write papers and look through our citation lists, uh, and we look around our lab, how diverse is that? Because that diversity is really important. If we can address those, we can address the double standards in our field and also address the disparate impact. Um, this is most for my colleagues, so you can you can all have to think about this. But uh, but are we investing in diverse people? And so if you're looking in terms of what it comes down to at the end of the day is how would we fund people? You know, do, are we investing them both in terms of time and money? Um, and so right now we're not very diverse at all. And so when you start to go into research, become faculty, and you start to look at your venture capital firms, you start to look at the federal funding climate. Um, look around and say, how diverse is that? And if it's not very diverse, then something has gone wrong. Um, and so we are, we, as, as the United States, we are supposed to invest in, in, in equal opportunity and have it incentivized. Um, that is written into law. So, there, you know, so there's no new legislation that has to be made uh, because the, title, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 basically says that if you're a, uh, an organization that uses that, that gets federal funds like the University of Michigan, uh, through research grants or student financial aid, that you have to make sure that you're providing equitable outcomes, um, and such as such as what we should be doing in the College of Engineering and uh, in computer science and mechanical engineering and the Robotics Institute. Um, and this really come in, and what came also came out of out of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that are, is Title IX, which came uh, out of the Educational Amendments of 1972, which, which basically said that you cannot, uh, that, if, that there has to be equal opportunity across, uh, across, um, across genders. Uh, so for anything that, that's available to a man in higher education should also be available to a woman. That means that's why we have a women's basketball team as well as a men's basketball team. Uh, and that, and that, and the, um, the founding of this in the 70s helped a lot of female scholars come into our field and actually helped it helped it uh, become a lot better um, over the last few decades. And so, uh, so that really is a foundation for what we're what we're what we're seeing. I'd like to say that President Nixon. Oh, I missed my punchline. I'd like to say that President Nixon, uh, you know, was uh, was this is a picture of him signing Title IX, but actually, it's the, there's no picture of that that I could find. Uh, it's actually Senate signing the Clean Air Act of 1970s. Uh, so presidents do care, have cared about the environment too. Um, and so really what, I, what I'm saying at the end of the day is that computing, robotics, what we're doing, it needs more empathy. I try to teach this class with a lot of empathy. Uh, that's why we're going to have in-person sessions. That's why we spend so much time on the, um, on the discussion channel to try to answer every question that you have, because that empathy is not just for the people that have been left out, but it's for everybody across the board. We need to have that uh, that um, that that sense of of we are in this together, and because you can't have not you can't have equal opportunity for anybody in this world unless you have equal opportunity for everybody. 
Um, and that really should be the thing that drives what we, how we think about our work and the consequences that will result. And the last point I would just make is I hope uh, go out and vote. Um, no matter if where, where, wherever you are, are sanctioned to vote, please go do that. That's how, how your voice is heard and, and a major way that you make a difference as a responsible citizen. All right, with that, I'm 10 minutes over. Sorry for the interruption. I am, uh, I am happy to answer, whoops. I'm happy to answer any questions that people might have. Um, or you can just head off and, and uh, join your study pod. If you attended, thank you for, for listening. And prior, prior, apologies for the disruption in between. And uh, I'm gonna turn the recording off so you can feel free to ask questions at, uh, at, your, at your leisure.